to have all of you in the studio, and I see you all got into the coffee pot, and you're back in here, so uh, we're ready to go. For those of you joining us on television, of course, you realize we're an informal Bible study, and that's why I've never apologized for the coffee cups around. And if you're ever coming through Tulsa, come and join us. We make four programs in a row, and after each half-hour program, we take a coffee break. And uh, we just have a good time all afternoon. I've never had anybody gripe yet that they wish they wouldn't have come. <laughs> okay, again, for those of you joining us out there on television, we uh, thank you. We just can't express our thanks enough for all of your letters and your encouragement, and especially for your prayers. Now, again, Iris wants me to announce that if you are interested in any of these programs today, they will be coming out in our book or tape number 54. And uh, always remember, we put 12 programs in a row in all of these uh, various vehicles, audio, video, and the printed page. Okay, now this is a Bible study, and we go right back into 1 Peter, and we were in chapter 3, and uh, we were in verse 12 when we stopped the last half hour, and we'll go back there for a moment. And uh, I've already had requests during the break time t to tell you where that verse was in Proverbs. So we'll look at that in just a second. But let's start here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. <clears throat> For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, so often the question comes, does God hear the prayers of evil people? What do you think? Would you if you were in God's position? No, unless it's for salvation. We know He's always bending the ear for salvation. But when evil, wicked people all of a sudden get the word from their doctor that they've got cancer, and oh, they can probably go to the chapel and they can pray. Do you think God hears their prayers? No, he doesn't hear those prayers. Now, if they're asking for salvation, of course. But the, the obstinate, the rebellious, no. God's not going to do anything for them. He's given them opportunity enough on the other side of the coin. So always remember that God is always aware of the righteous. They're his. They're his number one concern. The lost are his concern only because he's already purchased their redemption and he's not willing that any should perish. But don't ever think for a moment, like you many times have heard of battlefield deals with God. If you bring me through this particular battle, I'll go home and live for you. Well, when they get home, they forget all about it. Well, those prayers are never answered whatsoever. All right, so now then, if the Lord is... With the righteous, let's go back to that verse in Proverbs that I quoted in the last moment, seconds of the last program. And that's in Proverbs 14, verse 34. And as you're looking for it, I'm going to tell you what my thoughts so often are. In fact, I had a phone call this morning, early this morning. They said, Les, do you ever see a parallel between God's dealing with Israel and His dealing with America. Yes, there's a parallel to a degree. We're not under the covenant promises. But I think God has so blessed America since our founding was on biblical principles. We have been, for the most part, a God-fearing nation. And I think God has blessed us, even as He promised to bless Abraham back in the Old Testament. So I do draw a parallel, always have, that I think there is that that distinctiveness in God's blessing America like He has blessed no other nation on earth. And I've shared it with my classes here in Oklahoma. The thing that scares me to death as I see this great push to throw Christianity completely out of the American social fabric. Remember, that's what Israel did at times. But even though Israel always had that remnant of believers, Yet they were such a small remnant that the majority kicked God out of their thinking. They had wicked kings, and consequently, what did God have to do with the nation of Israel? Took them out. Brought in Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed the city, and they lost probably a million people. And they went into captivity. They went under the heavy boot of the, of the uh, Babylonians. Because the nation, for the most part, rebelled against God. But what happened to the believers? They went out with them. 
That's how Daniel ended up in the palace of, the, of Nebuchadnezzar, because he was one of the slaves taken out of Israel because of Israel's wickedness. Well, you see, I think the day is coming when God is going to do the same thing with America. I think Billy Graham said it years ago. I've said it before on the program that America has been left with so much responsibility. We've got churches on every corner, Bibles in every home, and we, like no other nation on earth, have been blessed of God. And if we are going to kick him out, then we can expect as a nation his wrath and his judgment to fall. We hope it won't. But on the other hand, this verse in Proverbs makes it so plain that that's the direction our nation is going. Now, the liberal press may not like that, and uh, the gross unbelievers in our society may not like it, but they still cannot remove the fact that God is sovereign, whether they believe it or not. All right, Proverbs 14, verse 34. <clears throat> never forget it. Memorize it if you never have before. Righteousness exalteth a nation. Remember when I said a program or two ago? What did Tocqueville realize? America was great because America is good. And America will cease to be great when America ceases to be good. Don't you forget it. All right, so righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now that's so plain a third grader can understand it. And if we as a nation don't understand it, we're in trouble. Now that's all there's to it. Of course, we hope the Lord will come before that should happen. All right, so back to 1 Peter again. <clears throat> Verse 12, just quickly for a review. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now verse 13, and who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Well, that sounds good, but what happens? A lot of times good people are persecuted. In fact, you know as well as I do, what prompted Nero to turn so viciously on the Christian community? Well, because he supposedly trumped up himself the burning of Rome and then blamed it on the Christian community and was able to turn on them, and the horrors that Nero brought on Christians, I don't even like to repeat in a, in a mixed crowd like this. It's beyond imagination. So yes, bad things can happen to even God's good people. All right, now verse 14. But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, <clears throat> happy are you, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Now, I've often wondered about that. Could we handle abject persecution like is taking place in so many places of the world? You know, I, I have to tell the Lord almost every day, I'm spoiled. We all are. We've had it so good. We haven't had to fear persecution. We haven't had to fear losing our livelihood. We haven't had to fear that somebody will come in the middle of the night and shoot us just because we're Christians. But if and when it should come, are we ready to handle it? Well, I always remember what an old pastor of mine, and hopefully he's still listening to my program. I remember a long time ago when Iris and I were first married, I, I spoke that fear to him one morning after church, and this was his answer. Les, don't worry about it. If and when that day comes, the grace of God will be sufficient. Well, I'm resting on that, and I think that must have been the case back in the Dark Ages when people were burned at the stake and they were put on the racks and my, the martyrs by the millions. And yet there's never a record that any of them ever complained. So grace must just be sufficient for the hour. But whatever, Peter is admonishing his believers here. Remember now that he's writing primarily, not exclusively, primarily to Jews there in the area of present-day Turkey, I feel, more than just the church at Jerusalem. But verse 14, if you suffer righteousness sake, happy you are, be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, what does that tell you? Well, that's just pretty plain English. No matter who it is, if they confront you under whatever circumstance and they say, well, now, 
I know you're different. I know you've got a different attitude than most people that I know. Why are you different? Well, what do you tell them? Because you have been saved by God's grace. You know that you're a child of God, and as a result, He has made you different. You have different uh, ideologies. You have different appetites. You have different desires. We're, we're different. We're, we're just not like the world. And we've got to be ready to tell anybody and everybody that stops and asks us. All right? Then verse 16, having a good conscience. In other words, not, not two-faced, not a hypocrite who on the one hand does one thing and tries to live something else, but having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation or manner living in Christ. Okay, what happens? Well, I've already given you an example of Nero. What did Nero do? He falsely accused that Christian community of setting Rome on fire, and he probably did it himself. Well, you see, that's just a blatant example of what the world does to believers constantly. They can trump up false accusations. In fact, I remember years ago quoting to someone uh, the words of the Lord Jesus himself. I hope I can recall them. Blessed are ye when men say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Did you get that? So it's going to happen. They're going to accuse you of doing something that's as false as a $3 bill. But if you know it's an untruth, then we don't have to let it bother us because the Lord Himself told us that that's part and parcel of our existence in a sin-cursed world, that they will falsely accuse us. And they were doing it here. And so Peter is admonishing them, don't let it throw you a curve, don't let it upset you because this is part and parcel of living a godly life in a wicked world. All right, but live your life so completely honest that even though they make false accusations, it will be proven a lie, and then they can be the ones that are embarrassed or ashamed. All right, verse 17, For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing, well, you see, our prisons are full of people who have done evil. And they live to regret it, of course, but my, the letters that we get from prison inmates, over and over and over. And it has prompted me to use the term bad choices, because that's what most of them will tell you. While they were growing up, they made bad choices. And if you know you make enough of them, that's where you'll end up, behind bars. And that's where a lot of them are now finding God's saving grace. I believe there's almost a revival of sorts amongst our prisons. And uh, it's just amazing the response that we get from the TV program as well as the little books. But nevertheless, here they have been guilty of doing evil and they're paying the price of it. Whereas if you suffer for well-doing, hopefully it'll be for nothing more than some persecution and so forth. All right, now we come into these day verses in Peter that again has caused so much controversy, so many questions, and I'm not sure that I'll be able to answer them to satisfy everybody. But we're going to take a stab at it. This is like you say, uh, you tread in where angels fear to tread. But uh, hopefully we can uh, make some sense out of it. Verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. And of course that goes back to that agony leading up to the cross. And he was the just suffering for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit of Christ never died. Don't ever think that for a moment, that God died when Christ died on the cross. His flesh died, yes, but never His Spirit. All right, verse 19, but it was in the realm of the Spirit then that he went and preached to the spirits, small spirit, which is the soul and spirit, 
of those who were in prison. Now, again, not everybody's going to agree with me, and I hope I'm going to have the time to do this. Uh, I think it might be worth our time. Back in the Old Testament economy, I'll take my chances of putting this on the board. Back in our Old Testament economy, and uh, down in the center of the earth, with a great gulf fixed, was Hades. Now I'll have to put these words up here. Hades was the term in the Greek. Sheol was the Hebrew. And hell is our English. And they all mean the same thing. The place of the departed or the dead. Now, up until Christ's death, burial, and resurrection then, this was all down in the centermost part. Now, I'm going to show you the scriptures in just a minute. This was all down in the centermost part of the earth. The Old Testament saints, and we'll go all the way back to Adam and Abraham and all the rest of them, they went at death down into hell or Sheol or Hades, but they went on the paradise side. Paradise. Now, the best way you can explain that is, what did Jesus tell the thief on the cross? Today thou shalt be with me where? In paradise. And this is exactly what he's talking about. That from the cross then, the thief as well as Christ himself in the realm of the spirit, not bodily, but in the realm of the spirit, Christ and the thief, I guess I better put another one over here, they went down into paradise. Over here is torment for the lost of all the ages. All right, now let's use the scriptures. Turn with me to Matthew. I didn't intend to do this. I didn't even cross my mind last night, honey, that I was going to do this. But uh, I think I'm thinking of all the questions that have come in. We'd better. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus and his earthly ministry. <coughs> Verse 38. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. All got it? Okay. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, right off the bat, what does that tell you? Jonah was a real event. It wasn't just a legend. All right, now verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights, where? In the heart of the earth. That's what the book says. I can't imagine now from all the pictures you get from science, the heart of the earth is molten. <laughs> Nothing but molten whatever. Well, I'll lay that aside. The book says in the heart of the earth is this place of the departed dead. All right, now in order to pick up a brief picture of that, and that's all it is, a little window of information is what I call it, in Luke 16. In Luke 16, with the rich man and Abraham and Lazarus. You all know the account. We don't have to read all these verses, hopefully. But this little window of information puts the whole picture together. <clears throat> Verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, who was laid at his gate full of swords. Well, verse 22. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. That's down in paradise. 
The rich man also died and was buried and in hell. Sheol. Hades. He lifted up his eyes, being in what? Torment. And he sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And so the rich man cries, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and so on and so forth. Now verse 25, Abraham answers, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receives thy good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil. But now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, now here comes the picture. Besides all this, between us and you, between paradise and torment, there is a great gulf fixed. See? So that they who would pass from here to you cannot, neither can you pass to us. And then he said, I pray thee therefore send thou my, uh, to my father's house and so on and so forth. But all I want you to get here is the picture then of this scenario in the heart of the earth that down on the one side of this Hades, Sheol and hell is paradise. The great gulf fixed on the other side is torment. Now, when the Apostles' Creed, I think it is, it says that they believe that Jesus died, was buried, and his soul went down into hell. My, that has thrown a curve at so many people. You mean Jesus went to hell? Well, not the flames of torment. My goodness, that wouldn't make sense. But he went down into paradise. And that's why he told the thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, not torment. All right, now then we've got to go over to Ephesians, and I think Paul kind of puts the frosting on the cake, and hopefully we can put all this together now. Now you come over to Ephesians, chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 8, 9, and 10. And then we'll try to put it together. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8, 9, and 10. <clears throat> All got it? Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. In other words, those souls that couldn't go into glory were down there in paradise like captives. Now that takes a little further explanation. When you look at the whole idea of the redemption process by blood, animals' blood could not take away sin. All animals' blood could do was cover it. I've used the expression, swept them under the blood, under the rug. So animals' blood could not take away the Old Testament believer's sin. Consequently, he could not go into God's holy presence until the atoning blood of Christ himself was shed. All right, that is the only blood atoning that can take away the stain of sin. Animals' blood couldn't do it. So it just follows then that after his death on the cross, the shedding of his blood, he went down into the paradise side and he preached to those spirits in prison, what? The atoning blood has been shed. I can now take you with me into the glory. Got it? All right, now look at Ephesians. So what is it that he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, those Old Testament believers waiting down in paradise. In verse 9, now that he ascended up into glory, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? How that fits with Matthew? See that? Now verse 10, he that descended down into paradise is the same that ascended up far above all the heavens that he might fill or fulfill all things. So now what happened? When Christ had shed the atoning blood, 
here on the cross, and he could tell the thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. They went down for those three days and three nights into the lower parts of the earth, but into the paradise side. And when Peter says he preached to those spirits in, sorry, in uh, captivity, this is what he could preach. The atoning blood has now been shed. You are now fit to go up into the heavens above the heavens. Now then, for these in torment, the Old Testament says that this has simply been enlarged. So instead of half of it being paradise and half torment, it is now evidently all torment. And when we speak of hell, that's what we normally think of, isn't it? The place of torment, the place of punishment. But in the Old Testament economy, it wasn't. It was the place of all of the departed dead. Oh, wow. Now we've just about shot the half hour. See, now come back with me to 1 Peter. And uh, we'll again pick up a couple more verses. <clears throat> Verse 19. So in the Spirit, while his body of flesh was laying in the tomb up there in Jerusalem, in the flesh... He went and preached to the spirits in prison who at one time were disobedient as all of fallen men have been. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing. How long? 120 years. 120 years God was patient with that wicked people living there at the time of Noah, while Noah and his sons and probably some hired help were building the ark. Okay, now that's what Peter is talking about, see? These people who had lived before the flood, they too had been sinners, but we know that God has always separated the human race between the lost and the saved. And even though from Adam until uh, Moses there was no law, there was no formal system of worship, yet there were saved and lost people. And so now when we get to the next verse in our next half hour, we're going to see that through the horrors of the flood, how many people were saved? Eight. And that's all. Okay. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding.